computer. And what else do we have to do? Look at participants, see if anybody shows up. Just me so far. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look at the PowerPoint slides. Do you guys keep an eye on the window back here? If in case somebody shows up, let me know. Okay. For the Zoom call. So what do we got today? Environmental cycles. We talked about the nitrogen cycle last week. Nitrogen cycle is how the plants incorporate nitrogen into the soil. They go about a process of fixing the nitrogen. Um, they take nitrogen gas, incorporate it, and uh, create a means of it. So we get ammonia or a nitrate, nitrate out of that and what kind of plants do that? It's um, legumes happen to do that. Lots of different plants are known as uh, nitrogen fixing plants. This is why it's good to put alfalfa in the field because alfalfa does this thing where it fixes the nitrogen and it creates healthy, nutritious soil. We get better crops there. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about Composting, well, not, not composting, the carbon cycle, the carbon cycle where everything breaks down from plants, essential sugars, and then we eat the plants, we break down, we take everything in from uh, carbon, comes introduced into our system from uh, carbon dioxide into plants, the plants to us eventually, and then back to either carbon dioxide or plants again. And here's my joke. Here I got news for you, sweetheart. I am the lowest form of earth, or lowest form of life on earth. Gary Larson. Are you guys all familiar with Gary Larson? Anybody not familiar with Gary Larson? Young people. Amish, you know, of, you're not familiar with Gary Larson? Gary Larson? Uh, when I was a younger guy, your age, he used to be in the newspaper. What did he call you? The Far Side. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was a it was a good comic strip. Yeah. Kind of a good comic strip. There's a compendium, like a life like a huge library volume. All of his work is in the one book. Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, I remember the horrible. Oh my God. Did he do Marmaduke as well? Yeah. I've got Marmaduke or something. I don't know. Hell no. Yeah, there are some uh, comic writers that did a couple of them. The guy that did Wizard of Id did a couple. Oh, uh, no, Gary Larson did just Gary Larson. We're just talking about different cartoonists. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, I should go to my Zoom meeting, say, share my screen. Okay, so um, going back a couple of weeks, I, I'm saying going back a couple of weeks because uh, final test is coming up next week. And what is on the final test? I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, we went over environmental factors for growth. What I'm going to do on the final test is come up with five questions 
from every lecture from the last four from the last four lectures. And so from this list of uh, topics, uh, we've got the growth curve, what are what's on the growth curve, your exponential stationary transitionary phase. Um, what are the three terms for bacteria that live in different temperatures? There's your mesophile, thermophile, and psychrophile. I thought of a great example of a psychrophile after class. Uh, and it was because I saw the snow is disappearing off of my lawn. After the snow is gone, you got snow mold. It's a great psychrophile. So the psych the, this uh, fungus lives between the snow and the grass layer and just creates fungus there that you don't see in the fall. <laughs> you clean up your lawn nice and, but by spring, there's lots of fungus there. So it's a, something that'll survive in cold. Um, then there's also your thermophiles, which survive in heat. Um, then there's the other environmental factor is oxygen, whether something can survive oxygen or not. And this has a couple of terms. It has the terms aerobe, facultative anaerobe, obligate anaerobe, uh, microaerophile. And so there's a couple of terms for you to kind of remember. Remember, obligate anaerobes are the ones that live right on the bottom. So when you looked at the uh, thioglycolate tubes last week, the organism that could only survive at the bottom, bottom I think was probably a clostridium. Uh, that's an obligate anaerobe, something that could survive within the whole thioglycolate tube. That would have been your um, facultative anaerobe, like E. coli. There was one that was right at the top. Uh, that would have been the, I'm trying to remember, Pseudomonas fluorescens. The Pseudomonas is a, a aerobic bacteria, so it can survive at the top. Whether it was micro aerophilic or just plain obligate aerophilic, that's or aerobe, um, that, that we can't do figure that out in just one test. You'd have to kind of do a whole bunch of tests to figure that out. Um, but there's those results. Uh, pH also came into play. We tried to figure out if your microbes could survive or grow good on different pHs. Uh, unfortunately, our acidic plate didn't turn out well. Ah, Jackie's coming. Okay, so uh, there's that. Uh, next, I have uh, industrial and biotechnology class. That was the next lecture after the environmental factors. So in that lecture, I talked about chocolate, kefir, coffee, tea, and cheese, and how these are foods that require some fermentation in order to be consumable. Uh, microbes make, th make things delicious somehow, <laughs> uh, whether it's cheese or um, coffee. Like we rely on a fermentation process or wine or beer or th these items, we require them to be fermented before we uh, have them as food. I also talked a little bit about making vitamin C and a little bit about and, uh, antibiotics, fuels, very little about fuels and bioremediation. I talked a little bit about uh, how microbes are used to do bioremediation and genetically more modifying organisms. Uh, there's that controversy with introducing gene to prevent plants from um, to prevent plants getting taken over by back uh, not back, back uh, it's an insecticide gene ET right this was toxin yeah. 
preventing corn. Uh, I can't remember the parasite. Corn borer. Thank you. Corn borer. Yeah. Now we have the genetically modified organism because uh, we have the bacteria that can transfer a little bit of DNA from a bacteria into a plant. And by using that technology, they've made plants that are resistant to the corn borers. Well, that's a long way to get there. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's lecture 10. Lecture 11, I talked about uh, antibiotics with Fleming and Waxman. Um, Salmon Waxman was the guy that came up with streptomycin, which helped with the tuberculosis infection and brought tuberculosis under control in North America and Europe and around the world as well. Um, also talked about what the term multidrug resistance is and some terms dealing with multidrug resistance, including how microbes can chemically protect themselves. They can remove antibiotics or modify um, their own targets to eliminate the drugs or even block the drugs. There's also gene transfer and there's three terms. Do you guys remember these? There's transfection, conjugation, transformation. Um, one of them dealt with viruses, how viruses can bring DNA into an, uh, DNA into a host. The other one is conjugation where microbes can align next to each other and pass DNA back and forth. And transformation where uh, microbes can take up DNA from the environment. And I also talked about the nitrogen fixation cycle, especially rhizobium bacteria, these bacteria that live around the roots of plants. Okay. And they help fix nitrogen. So that's kind of like a review of the last two weeks. Um, and like I was saying, I've also arranged tomorrow to be in lab. Uh, Stacy's aware that I'll be there. She saved some samples for me from last week. Um, and I said that there's different times for labs being due, but if you can get the labs into me, if anybody's got a lab that's outstanding this week, Friday, please <laughs> be the last kind of time. Um, I have to, I'm not exactly sure what day the grades are due, but it'll be after Monday next week or Tuesday next week. So I'll, I'll have to get your stuff graded and posted by next week, Wednesday or Thursday, I think. Um, final exam. So there was a concern that the test was on Easter Monday. So I've spread it out over two days. If you can't do it Easter Monday, Easter, well, Tuesday, the Tuesday following next week, just till noon. So from noon to noon, I'll give you 24 hours to do the test. It's a one hour test. Good luck. Ah, so just between those two days. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no. Good luck. Like do well, do, do your best. Be awesome. Just, sorry. I don't mean to. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean it to be. <sighs> okay, so like I was saying, 20 points. I said the total test on this uh, test is 60 points. And what I want you to do is try and get you a flavor for some new of the new material. And by doing that, what I'll do is ask like five questions per these last four final four lectures. So every lecture is going to be about five questions. Um, and then there's 20 points for old stuff, like stuff we've taken from before, and then 20 points for long answer. And the question is, uh, what are long answer kinds of things? Well, what's on a growth curve? What are the stages of growth? Um, lag phase, exponential phase, stationary phase, death phase, like be able to name them and explain what's going on at that point. 
Okay. Uh, name an organism used for one of the following streptomycin. Where do we get streptomycin from? Where do we get uh, bacitracin? Yeah. Do you remember what it's named? Streptomyces. Uh, just, you'll recognize it when you see it, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it'll be a multiple choice question. So, or, or a long answer question. So you should be able to try and figure out what it was. Greasius, I think was the name. Streptomyces greasius. Uh, Bacitracin was uh, Bacillus subtilis. Polymyxin, Bacillus um, polymyxa. And vitamin C, what was vitamin C? Gluconobacter oxidans, I think is the name of the microbe that was responsible for vitamin C. So they do a fermentation of some feedstock and it converts to a molecule that they use to make vitamin C. Pardon? Gluconobacter oxidans, I think. You want me to check? Uh, let's check. That's lecture. Keep checking. <laughs> lecture 10, I think. Yeah, it's not from last week. It's from. Oops. I will help us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's. Uh, it, so there's a one step process where gluconooxidans is. Gluconobacter oxidans is involved in doing the um, conversion. And there's another fermentation process where they have two bacteria. I'm not worried about that one. I'm just more worried about. Well, sure one. I think it's lecture 10. So not last week, but the week before. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and some other long answer questions. Um, so thinking about food handling and microbiology, what are some appropriate things you have to do for handling food? There's like a hundred things. Yeah, wash hands, sterilization, sterilize the bench, avoid cross-contamination, avoid cross-contamination, all these things. Okay. So when you're handling food, be aware that there's a bunch of things you can do to prevent microbes. Um, don't allow infected people to handle food. Like if you know they're infected, get them away from the kitchen. Yeah. Good management procedures, yeah. Use sterile equipment, use sterile benches. Employees keep their households clean. Wear a proper hairnet, that sort of thing. Um, could you guys identify a food organism that is a pathogenic food organism and talk about it? Can you think about what we've done over in the course? Uh, e. coli is a good one. Salmonella is a good one. Listeria. Clostridium botulinum. Yeah. Candida. And so there's several uh, examples of microbes that you could talk that are pathogenic. How about beneficial ones? Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Try and remember the proper yeah, names for them too. Lactobacillus. Streptococcus thermophilus. That's in yogurt. Uh, what is the one in uh, from Bulgaria? Lactobacillus bulgaric? Bulgarius? That's in the uh, often found in yogurt. Is it a lactobacillus or a streptococcus? This. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so there's 
beneficial organisms, um, be able to describe sterilization processes, like how is the sterilization process different from disinfection? Everything's dead. Most are dead, yeah. Antibiotic drug, so I just have a couple of long answer type questions there. Okay, so overview for today. Uh, I'm talking about carbon cycle. Now, I saw Jackie come in. She didn't say anything. Oh, Jackie, can you see the presentation? Ah, good. Good to see her. Okay. Um, so I was just checking to make sure, Jackie, you could see it as well. What do we have with uh, carbon cycle? So there's a couple of terms here for the carbon cycle. There's the term autotroph, heterotroph, and methanogen. Um, there's also the phosphorus cycle. And with that, we'll take a look at the minerals, plants, and decomposers. Um, and as far as the federal legislation things, I'm just going to talk about the Canadian containment level idea. It's very similar to what is in the United States. Um, in Canada, it's referred to as a containment level. In the United States, they use uh, biological safety. So uh, they'll say BSL, oh, biological, biological safety level one, or BSL two, BSL three, BSL four, or in Canada, we have CL1, CL2, CL3, CL4. It's just a different naming convention. Um, and then I'll show you the website for where you can look at uh, food handling. Okay, so, oops, let me just move the chat out of the way. So the carbon cycle, uh, in the carbon cycle we have, arrow spotlight, we have carbon dioxide in the air. And this is the source of our carbon. So the carbon dioxide in the air undergoes photosynthesis in plants. Plants convert the carbon dioxide by photosynthesis. They take the carbon and they remove the oxygen and they create sugar from it. And so this is what we end up as uh, a product for us. And for all of life is we have this source of sugars. So we have uh, photosynthesis from plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. Um, the blue-green algae are referred to as cyanobacteria. You have heterotrophs. Uh, heterotrophs. Autotrophs. This is a term. Um, Plants photosynthesize the carbon into feedstock. Heterotrophs eat the carbon and then convert it back into CO2. So here you have the organic matter. It's into food. You have a heterotroph eating the food and then they respire carbon dioxide. So every, all um, mammals, reptiles, birds, whatever, respire carbon dioxide. So we eat these plants and then we give off the carbon dioxide. There's also organic waste and the organic waste is then cycled into the soil and the complex carbon material is biodegraded, eventually forming carbon dioxide, which is then going back into photosynthesis.
So carbon is thought of as the backbone of your molecules. So you have uh, like a simple fatty acid, carbon, hydrogen around it. Um, what organisms can do is they can extend this carbon chain so that it's not just like three carbons like you can go on and on and on. So you can get all kinds of fats being developed through fatty acid synthesis. Um, and what do we use fatty acid synthesis for? It's uh, our barriers. <laughs> Like all cell membranes are made up of fatty acids. So if you think about it, we need carbon as this backbone. The backbone helps us structure, for, give us structure for bones, for cells, for everything we have. Um, in an oxidized form, when I say oxidized, it's you've got oxygen on it. Uh, it's carbon dioxide, um, and that's referred to as an inorganic molecule because there's no hydrogen. And we have to convert the carbon dioxide to make food. So what do we do? Uh, plants they take the carbon dioxide, they use the energy of the sun, and they convert that into oils, cellulose, starch. So at the bottom here, you can see you take a little bit of water, you take your carbon dioxide and energy from the sun, and you make sugar. When you do that, the process also gives us oxygen. So isn't that really nice for us? <laughs> so it's making sugar, making food, and also making a breathable environment for us. Um, this process of taking carbon dioxide, which is oxidized, and then adding hydrogens onto it is referred to as a reduction. So it's just reducing the carbon dioxide by removing some of the oxygen. Okay. So what do we have as uh, producers? We've got two primary producers at the bottom of the food chain, like cyanobacteria, algae. They're your primary producers. Um, and the oldest rocks on earth that have evidence of life are these uh, stones they think are the leftover algae that are a couple of billion years old. So they think that algae has been on the planet for half a billion to a billion years. Um, and they form these fossils. So you can see fossilized algae in these rocks. Anyway, uh, just carry on. So you have the prokaryotes, cyanobacteria, lithotrophs, methanogens forming. Uh, they take up biomass and they're autotrophs, meaning that they take in the carbon dioxide and they make their own food. Autotroph, auto feeding. Okay. And that's uh, part of the global carbon cycle of making this sugar molecule. I know it's not a chemical equation, it's not balanced. It's just kind of like an example, okay? Uh, there's three oxygens on the left, one on the right. It, don't, don't look at that, <laughs> just think, okay? Okay, so... But what happens to the other two oxygen? I guess it would be given off as oxygen gas. Oh, I can go back and fix that later. Carbon fixation. Um, we have also fixation of carbon at uh, without oxygen present. So anaerobic organisms can also fix oxygen. So you have something like green sulfur bacteria, red. Uh, filamentous phototrophs, and here's the name of one, chloroflexi. Uh, you have got 
something like purple bacteria, acidobacteria. What they do is they also take carbon dioxide and they use sulfur, um, hydrogen sulfide and light to make sugar. So not quite uh, a photosynthetic process, but they take the carbon dioxide in, they need a little bit of sulfuric gas, light, and out comes sugar. And this is done, like I said, anaerobically. Um, so who, what is it? Uh, this simplified diagram. Oh. Sulfur and water. It's kind of a rough kind of way of saying you take in the sulfur gas, it gives off sulfur, but that's a way of the organisms use uh, that starting material, that feedstock in order to make their sugars. Okay, so next it's heterotrophs. It's no really good place for chaff. <laughs> is there try there heterotrophs um, heterotrophs they take carbon in some form and they convert it back to co2 so if you think the horse eats grass the grass has sugar the horse converts that with its digestive system to give off gas or cows Anyway, so there's a relationship between your autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs fix carbon, and then the heterotrophs eat the sugars that the autotrophs make. And the heterotrophs produce carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide is used by autotrophs. So it's kind of a contribution to the cycle, the carbon cycle. Um, so here we have carbon dioxide, water, you get your organic material like sugars, and then the sugars are oxidized by the animal, and the animal gives off oxygen and water. Whoops. So that's referred to as heterotrophy. So there's autotrophy and heterotrophy. Carbon dioxide is the prevalent greenhouse gas, and it's important to get these two equations balanced. Because if one is overproducing, then um, that's no good. And things that can unbalance the equation include rainforest destru destruction, replacing the uh, rainforest with cattle herds. Because what you're doing is you're removing the generation of oxygen, the contribution uh, into it's a simplified argument, but that's kind of the argument there. All right, there's also an organism called a methanogen. And methanogens uh, typically live in deep, dark places like under the ocean. And what they'll do is they'll take methane and convert it into sugars for themselves. Um, Methanogens, it says here, inhabit all anaerobic environments. So if you have carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas and it's anaerobic, you can, you'll find yourself a methanogen. Um, where do methanogens commonly come up? Uh, you hear of them in the intestines of cattle because cattle have heavy methanogens. Yeah, question? I didn't know this was one of the lighter uh, uh, products I was working for. What the company does was like they, they have the slot, uh, the waste from the building. It, it, it goes the waste treatment plant. So the, the bacteria, I, I don't think it's a bacteria, it should be good. Have some the, have some the waste. I'm conversing with the 
and the design is piped back to the boiler and you immediately have the electricity. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a, that's a very <laughs> smart use of the feedstock. But what the is that the design is very well received because of uh, I think it's because of sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfur. Great, because the yeah. sulfur oxidizes the metal. It, it's a little bit controversy to say that Jordan was like uh, getting a sulfur, uh, sulfur digest that had to be to solve or something. Did that work? Did that work? Did that work? Get rid of getting rid of the sulfur? No, it, it, it was. Is a work in progress? Yeah. It should work. The sulfur was like um, uh, destroying the, some parts of the soil. Yeah, so, um, and you could also use the sulfur later in other industrial uses. So it's a good use of uh, chemical waste, brewery waste. Yeah. Um, if you go by a water treatment plant, sometimes they'll have these pipes that have flames. And you would like, what the heck is that? It's methanogens, they're producing methane gas. They wanna just get rid of it. So they just burn it off like that. They don't conserve it like you would have used a, a proper use for methane gas. Huh. Okay, so um, anywhere there's anaerobic and there's carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas, you have methanogens. And so the carbon dioxide is used up distinctly. 5% um, is taken up, it says here, and reduced. And the other 95% of the CO2 is reduced to methane. So carbon dioxide and hydrogen dioxide, hydrogen gas is converted to sugars and methane, and that's methanogenesis. We have here, methane, uh, methane accumulates in rocks as fuel, fossil fuel in cow, guide, cow guts, guts of termites, sediment swamp, landfills, and sewage digesters. Uh, last step of the carbon cycle is biodegradation, decomposition, and the sugars are turned back to CO2. Here's one where it's depolymerized. You have your cellulose, and then the cellulose is converted into monomers. So if it's uh, undergoing that kind of breakdown, it's just breaking down into single glucose units. There's also fermentation. They take the monomers, and they convert that into lactic acid, acetic acid, propionic acid, or some sort of fatty acid. There's also anaerobic respiration where you take your monomers and add oxygen and you get carbon dioxide and water. So that's the final step of the carbon cycle. Uh, and here's a saying, there's no known natural compound that cannot be degraded by some microorganism. <laughs> You think about that. Microbes manage to break everything down somehow. Um, a lot of so they, they're used everywhere to break stuff down, and uh, they're used in our what is it the uh, compost in order to break down all the food stuffs that we have back to the original or. PM, larger organisms break the compounds down. And here's someone, uh, proof of this saying, we aren't up to our ears and whatever it is that can't be degraded in the last three and a half million years. So things are always making sugars, but things are always breaking them down. So <laughs> if uh, it was just making it, we would have this mountain of stuff that would never get used, but it's all being used. I'm skipping questions today, um, but 
you, if you, unless you guys want to go through the questions. What is carbon fixation? Right. Uh, describe the balance between primary producers and other organisms. Um, the reason I'm going to just kind of blow through this is I'm not asking anybody else to uh, answer questions anymore. Like, um, which re reminds me, <laughs> not everybody answered their questions on the day that uh, I asked them to. If you're one of those people, um, you can go back to the lecture, answer the questions, and just treat that as an assignment. And I'll I'll take that as uh, your questions for that day. Uh, I'll post the grades. Okay. So I, I'm, I think just what everybody here is okay. <laughs> if you've attended class, you've answered your questions, you're fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, the purpose of my incorporating questions into the course was so that people who are online, I, I would hear from you guys. So you'd, but people are in class. I hear from you guys in class. It's a little better. Um, methanogens are different than other primary producers. They produce methane. What is the source of carbon for microbial carbon fixation? And like I said, carbon dioxide gas. Okay, so that's the carbon cycle. Phosphorus cycles next. Phosphorus cycle. How do we get our phosphorus? It's different than the nitrogen cycle. It's different than the carbon cycle in that instead of us breathing or uh, organisms breathing in the um, phosphate, they have to take it from minerals. So erosion of rocks and whatnot will erode down into soil and then microbes will take the phosphorus that come from minerals and absorb that and use the phosphorus, incorporate that into their structures and use that. And then we break down the plants and then we excrete the waste and the plants either uh, it either goes back to the bacteria that directly transfer to phosphorus that eventually goes back to the soil or it undergoes a different decomposition where it goes into plants so it could either be decomposed by fungus or it can be decomposed by bacteria either way it is, get, is recycled. So the phosphorus is always recycled. So it breaks down from minerals. Um, and then we in, take it in from the plants that uh, the, the autotrophs and the autotrophs feed us. That's the phosphorus cycle. So there's this term inorganic phosphate. Um, it would be just a mineral molecule. It's part of the structure of the mineral. It starts off in the rocks. Rocks are broken down either by falling down off the mountain through a river stream. Um, these crushed rocks then are degraded and the phosphate and the minerals are eventually absorbed by plants and then the microbes consume the plant and then it's the microbes decompose that they're recycled and so we have this phos uh, phosphate inorganic phosphate in this one form po4 that converts into the kind that we use so why is this important <laughs> Uh, phosphate is the backbone of all of our DNA. If you just take a look at the DNA there, you've got your sugar, ribose sugar, 
attaches to a phosphate, attaches to another sugar, attaches to a phosphate, another sugar phosphate. So it goes all the way up this. This is the polymeric uh, backbone of the DNA. And then you have your TAGC along this backbone. If you have uh, RNA, you've replaced the T with the uracil. So it's a adenine, guanine, thymine, 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 adenine, HGT, and with that RNA, it'd be almost the same thing, only instead of a T, it'd be a U with a uracil. Uracil or uridine? Oh, I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> um, just a side note, I was looking for a picture, a nice picture of uh, DNA. I got this from genome.gov from the United States, and it's a NIH site. And when I was looking for things, they also mentioned Watson's work. Uh, you recall Watson is the famous scientist that discovered the structure of DNA. Um, on the website, they were saying, disclaimer, not, uh, you, you know how, it's almost like cancel culture. It's even in science too. They're not too happy with some of the things that uh, Watson would say. He he's said things about, he was kind of racist as well as a uh, misogynist. So he, he didn't believe that women were good scientists. He didn't believe that other races were as good as his race. Uh, some, some of the things that he has said have been debunked. <laughs> um, Anyway, I, that, that popped up when I was looking for this picture. It's kind of interesting where, where you find or what you see how culture is changing over time. Uh, have any of you read the story of the discovery of DNA? It's an interesting story. It's kind of like the race between um, different groups. Uh, Watson was the American who joined the lab in England. He and Crick were in one lab. Another lab was uh, another building. Not too far away was Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind, Franklin. so the two of them, they had uh, research programs. Uh, and there is some miscommunication between Wilkins and Franklin where did I get the right Wilkins and yeah Franklin Wilkins thought that he was hired to do the study of DNA and that was going to be his discovery but Franklin was uh, a scientist in her own right she's already doing the research and th there's some sort of animosity there and that's why he shared her photographs unbeknownst to her with uh, Watson and Crick it's kind of a underhanded thing to do but that's what's that late 50s early 60s so we haven't really known the structure of dna for all that long it's only what 70 years 60 years another really famous scientist who was going after it was linus pauling he believed that uh, DNA was a three-stranded molecule. He had some results that suggested it was three strands. So he went after this idea that everything was a three-stranded DNA molecule. And, uh, but that's another story. Anyway, phosphorus in biology. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, phosphorus is there all along in the backbone of our DNA. Uh, other places we really need phosphorus is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. In order for us to have energy, cellular energy, we have to have these molecules that attach phosphorus to it. Okay, so phosphorus is the constituent of nucleic acids. There's a long ways to get there. Sorry. Um, phosphorus is used by organisms 
found in found in the phospholipids of cell membranes. So it's even part of the membranes. Remember I was talking about how uh, these lipids, they have a phosphorus, phosphorus tail. Um, and the phosphate molecules on the outside, and so the hydrocarbon kind of makes its tail. And they all pack together really tightly and you get this bi-level layer to make a cell with the phosphate on the outside. So it's polar on the outside, anyway. Uh, phosphorus is used by all organisms. It's found in the phospholipids of cell membranes, and it's also in adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate. So A is the nucleotide, and it's just adding on to phosphate. There's also uh, GTP, ATP. Um, I don't think TTP is very common, or CTP, maybe. Uh, but it's ATP and GTP that are the most common ver ver forms of this kind of structure that we use for energy. So we have here your ribose sugar with adenosine and three phosphates attached to that. So there's your ATP molecule. Um, phosphorus cycle ends. Here I'm talking about dissolved phosphate ends up in the water supply. Um, phosphate used to make up a really large and important part of the suds that we had in our cleaning products. Um, the phosphate is returned to land by shore animals, birds, they feed on the phosphorus, they deposit its feces on land. It's also a geological process. So you get the uplift of rock and that is returned, but that's a really slow process. Um, there is a concern with phosphorus. A lot of our soaps don't have as much phosphorus anymore. You're, I, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but when I was a small child, the TV ads all said, oh my God, so many bubbles so many strong bubbles these bubbles last forever and yeah they you had these cleaning products that were great for how many bubbles they had and how bubbling they were and it's a uh, phosphate that helped with the bubbling activity of these chemical compounds and it caused all kinds of problems downstream they're like there's too many bubbles in your uh water treatment plants, there's too many bubbles in the lakes and streams, there's killing off fish and stuff. So um, because of that, we now have cleaning products that have less phosphorus. So how do you fix that? My, my friend in university, uh, he had a clue, uh, I had a great idea, he just buy the box of tea TSP, the trisodium phosphate cleaner, and just add it to all the <laughs> detergent. <laughs> so he uh, on purpose added more phosphate. So he had a, anyway. Um, but we don't have as many bubbles in our cleaning products, but we have concerns that if we have too many phosphates into our cleaning products, we have downstream problems. So it's kind of like a balancing act. What is the source of phosphorus utilized by microbes? There's my questions. From the rocks down to the plants, yeah. Uh, two molecules that rely on phosphate. ATP. ATP. And, uh, ADP. ADP. Also DNA, RNA. Good, you got them. Uh, what cellular structure is formed using phospholipids? Yeah, our cell walls are made up of phospholipids. Okay, and the phosphorus cycle, I want to go ahead and try and explain that. Exactly, perfect. Phosphorus cycle. All right, so that's uh, the two 
environment for cycles. And now we've got the, the Canadian information, the federal laws. Uh, just to kind of show you, last night I looked up. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, not that. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I don't know. We've gone from microbiology to dinosaurs. I love it. We're still in biology, at least. Uh, so there's my hometown, northern Alberta. I'm from Grand Prairie, which is half hour from one day, 20 minutes, 20 minute drive. So there's a, another international museum there. I plug for the Wembley Museum, okay? I've never been there, but I hear they have dinosaurs and it's cool. Um, it's because the area around Grand Prairie has hadrosaurs and tyrannosaurs and albertosaurs and other kinds of dinosaurs. Let's see. Huh, Triceratops, a Gorgosaurus liberatus. So they have some skeletons there, pretty cool. So there is the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology in Drumheller. That's also really cool. So if you guys ever, I don't know why you'd go to Wembley. <laughs> oh, I don't know why we're going out there, but okay, we'll go. Okay. If you're going to go onto the Alaska Highway, it's on the way. Oh. So Edmonton to Alaska, you'll probably pass by. I'm still by... not sure why we're going to Alaska, but okay. <laughs> Glaciers. Let's see here. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I could start heading towards the law before Alberta and make Alaska a lot quicker. Um, I looked up who's, I, I clicked on the wrong link there, who's responsible for uh, making these laws that I've got here. The food and drug are all controlled under the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. So this is the Minister of Agri-Food. Her name is Marie Claude. A small, I say small, it's probably huge. It's a very important sort of department, but um, responsible for the legislation regarding microbes. Did you guys know that there's real legislation about pickles and cheese? Oh, yeah. You knew this? Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you apply for a job with a company, they might ask you to do a biosafety test. And typically on a biosafety test, you have to kind of talk about sanitation, learn about organism handling. And it's usually a 100% test. You have to study some material and then pass the test. Um, the term that Canadians use is containment level. Like I was saying earlier, the term that Americans use is biosafety level. So it's very similar. It's just a different uh, terminology. So the Canadian laws have CL as opposed to BSL. Um, so depending on the organism, there's a different level that you have to contain things at. And here's level one. Level one. You have to achieve by segregating work areas from surrounding public and administrative areas and establish designated spaces within the work area where biological material may be handled. So what does that mean? That's the law. It means you have to segregate a workspace for microbes with a level one organism. So if you're working with um, the fungus that makes brie, you have to have a special area in your company that works with microbes. That's separate from the administrators, that's separate from the public. How is it separated? It doesn't say. And then they ship it in everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, and everybody uses it they put it in their fridge they're happy to use it yeah, yeah. Um, so there's level one the work areas have to be designated or sorry designed to be easy to clean and decontaminate 
So you have to incorporate emergency and safety features to protect everybody. You don't want animals escaping because the uh, CL1 also includes animals. And there's also pest control as well with these places. I've included a link to the website that gives the information for containment levels in case you're ever interested. So if you're going to go to work for a company in the future and they ask you, what do you know about microbial handling? You could say, well, uh, we learned about containment levels in our course. Um, here are the other containment levels. Can I move this? Yeah. Okay. So you have, uh, I can't. There's no minimize button on this thing. Ah, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> Suffering with that all lecture. So containment low zones are separate from public and administrative areas by door. There's what's different between level one and level two. You have a door. Here's another difference between level one and level two. You have a workstation within the containment zone is it's segregated from lab workstations or animal rooms, animal cubicles, and post-mortem rooms. So you have workstations, yeah. So, and they're spelling it out. You have to have a door and it has to be separate from everything else, okay? Uh, and then you have level two is one source. And then there's your level two agriculture. So with level two agriculture, the lab work areas have to be located outside of the animal cubicles. And your cold storage is going to be adjacent to the PM room, uh, post-mortem room. So if you are working on a strain of microbe, you kill an animal with that strain of microbe, you'll have a post-mortem room or an autopsy room that has to be separate from the cold storage area. Oh, Jason too. Okay, that's level two. Level three, there's a level three and there's level three agricultural as well. Um, and you notice they have the same things except this one point right there for legal level three agriculture where they're killing animals with the level three organisms. Structure and location of containment zone to be designed to withstand internal and external environmental factors. Also, uh, earthquake proof, <clears throat> earthquake proof, tornado proof, fireproof. And then the final level, level four, has everything. Um, and just to let you know, Canada has, uh, oh, sorry, we have, Durham College has a level two lab. So the lab that you guys work in, that's a CL2 lab. That's why at the end of the lab, we ask, do you want to get rid of your lab books? You can uh, get rid of your lab coats. They're in the CL2 lab. You have to sterilize them before using them outside of the lab. And the only way you can do that is by autoclaving them. And so that's what Stacy's doing with the lab coats that you guys had. She's autoclaving them and then tossing them to the bin. Um, it seems like a, a waste, large waste, but that's the regulations we're, we're, we have to go by. So there's different pathogens that are food poisoning microbes. There's E. coli, the EHEC uh, OH157, Listeria monocytogenes, botulism. They don't, I don't know where COVID-19 fits in. Uh, I can't tell you. Is it level two, level three, level four? 
don't know. They probably don't even know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't ask China because I think you need to realize it. Here's a photograph from science.gc.ca. Uh, there's one level four lab where the guy has to get into a bunny suit and the uh, air is ventilated into a suit. The, uh, the CL4 lab is in Manitoba, Winnipeg. Pardon? They, they <laughs> uh, they're, they're trying to get one out east as well, I think. But I don't know how that's going. I, I'm not sure. But I just know that that's the only one that Canada has. Where do they work there? There, Ebola, SARS, Lassa fever, Marburg virus, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, nasty. I was going to say they sound lovely, but I don't want to know what half more. Bleeding from the everything. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> it seems to be that what they mostly have there is hemorrhagics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, and they make the news every once in a while, too. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a Chinese researcher that was not doing everything by the book, uh, and she got mm -hmm. into trouble. The Chinese government got into trouble with what they're doing there. I don't know. There was a huge big thing about Ebola within the last few years. Yeah. Or, I don't I was going to say it was in Africa, but then it came up somewhere else as well. I, mean, I want to say it was China. And the outbreak was like here, and it was in Texas. Yeah. I remember she, that. Yeah, my sister's an RN, and she had volunteered there. So she had us on, all on a group call to let us know that she was volunteering, that if her hospital got a patient, she would be working with them, and that she was letting us know. And I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> yeah. She okay? Hmm? She's okay? Um, yeah, no, she was just burnt out with COVID, but she's been doing a lot of me telling me stuff. Yeah, the uh, Americans also have traveling doctors, or not traveling doctors, traveling nurses. Uh, have you guys heard of this? So in the States, not every hospital has the same regulations. Um, oh. They can declare an emergency, and if an emergency is declared, then they can hire nurses for a certain period of time. And so nurses from all over the country come to that hospital. Our Canadian nurses are going down there. And uh, yeah, because it's really good money. Yeah, and I was gonna say a lot of the hospitals down there work with a larger company. Mm -hmm. So they have some individual hospitals all over the place, but they're working with a larger company on staff in all the hospitals, not just the one. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult for Americans to kind of work with this because you have a hospital where you have two nurses, one's getting paid way more than the one that's been there for 20 years. So there's some sort of, they haven't quite figured it out yet, but, but this is something they do. Dangerous right now in times of as living through this pandemic, you see when they're going between hospitals a lot. That's um, they I think I, I'm just going to, I, I think that was the problem with the um, healthcare, um, like in the nursing homes, was a lot of the aides were working at multiple homes. So one of the... Because they're such poor jobs, the right? They, they, they're, they're poor jobs, they don't pay a lot. Right, they were working at this home and then they were working at that See, home. So when you have an outbreak happen and it's the caregiver that's sick, she's making everybody here sick and everybody there sick. So I think now... They've limited, like you can't work between different homes as one of the things. So I'm saying with nurses, that's kind of dangerous too. If they're working at five different hospitals, you know. The way they got around that, because I have a friend that specifically worked for a hospital that in the states that works with like this. Uh, they actually designated one of their hospitals as a COVID ward. So the whole hospital switched over between COVID. And you, as a staff, went in, you go in, you do your shit, like whatever it was, a 10 day, then you would come off and do 14 days off in isolation before you could go back to the regular side of things. Wow. It was a whole. Yeah. 
traumatic. Everybody, right? And, and uh, everybody's mental health. It just it pops up in kind of weird places. Right. I think we're all at that point where maybe we're at our collective. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. My cousin worked in a lab where he had to wear a bunny suit, um, but he was working in the chip industry. And he what? Silicon chip industry. He was working manufacturing. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nacho cheese secret lab. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. I think it was his, the chips he worked on went into PlayStation. Um, that kind of thing. So it would be a, a super clean location. Though. Yeah. Yeah, that was not so much for my growth. That just to keep, keep the material yeah. clean. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the the only lab we have in Canada is in Manitoba in Winnipeg. So here's the regulations on food, and food and drugs are regulated federally. And here's the link to the regulations. Here's a page on pickle regulations. So if you want to ever look up the regulations on pickles, <laughs> it's lots and lots of, yeah, this is uh, directly from this uh, website. So laws, loi, justice, government of Canada.ca. So if you ever want to look at them, you're free, feel free to look. So. What does it say here? Pickles and relishes shall be the product prepared from vegetables or fruits with salt, vinegar, and may contain spice, seasoning, sugar, food color, preservatives, film, firming agents, polyoxylethylene 20, sorbitan, monoaliate, and the amount not exceeding 0.05%, lactic acid, citric acid, sucralose. Lots of stuff can go into your pickles. That's pickle regulations. Cheese regulations are even longer. <laughs> it goes, you think uh, anything else is bad, don't go to dairy. Anything is dairy. Cheese, tons and tons. Yes. Pardon? I know this. No, no, what was your name? Do your pickles fall? Uh, spice? Vinegar. That's that's all I add. Spice. Oh, and salt. So, speed. Yeah, my mind. Where's vinegar? You see it? Oh, salt and vinegar make it taint. Ah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> oh. So, my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't put anything untoward in it. And so there's cheese regulations, there's wine regulations, and you could just go on and on forever with all of the things. Like this is caramel at a maximum level of use consistent with good manufacturing practice. So you could add, or you could have caramel in there. Brandy, fruit spirit, or alcohol derived from alcoholic fermentation of a food source, not less than 94% alcohol by volume. So they have to spell everything out. Okay, and that's it. That was my information. So what's the difference between a CL2 and a CL4? A door is really a bunny, a bunny suit or a not bunny suit? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And that's the uh, next question. Yeah. Uh, did, have any of you written a biosafety test yet? Um, I'm a little iffy. You haven't yet? Okay. You're not too sure? So if you uh, go to a biosafety course at the end of the biosafety course, they get you to write the exam. So you have the credit that you are, you've taken the biosafety test.
Uh, I've taken the several biosafety tests over the course of the last couple of years, just to be a graduate student, you had to be a, you had to have the biosafety test, you had to have the CAM. Women's test, yeah. And, and really that's it. So remember uh, next week, April 18th to the 19th, good luck. Um, and here's Roger cramming for his microbiology midterm. Let's see. <laughs> and thanks everyone for listening. You. Good luck. Hey. <laughs> Hope it goes well for you with your final test, your assignments. Uh, like I said, if you have any assignments or labs to hand in to me, uh, I'll try and open things up again, but make sure it gets into me, okay? I could ask Jackie here. Any questions? Thanks, guys. Uh, good luck, Israel. Good luck, everyone. Coming. Uh, let me just stop this. How do I get this? Are you even Bye. 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 Bye.